All right. Guess what? This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks podcast. My name is Jay Brown. I want to welcome you and thank you. I really appreciate that you're listening. And if you're someone who's been tuning in for a long time, if you're someone who tunes into these intros just to see how I'm doing, and I know there's some of you out there who do that because you've sent me emails telling me so, first, just thanks. It's, it's incredibly sweet and warms my heart to think that there's those of you who, who don't even really even care about the talks, but just tune in to hear how I am. That's really lovely. I appreciate that. But this week's not a week for that. We've got business to tend to. I actually do have some stuff going on that I'd be happy to talk with you about, but we'll do it next week. This episode is actually not the regularly scheduled episode. We were going to listen to the talk that I recorded with Theo Wildcroft when I was in England last month, but I ended up having this talk with Andrew Tanner from the Yoga Alliance just last week. And normally we don't, we don't do it that quick. Like there's usually a good three to five weeks even between the time that I record a podcast and the time that I post it out. And you kind of have to have that lead time in order to be consistent, I think. If I want to have quality episodes out each week, I need to have like some lead time, especially if I'm traveling and stuff and just trying to schedule these talks with people. It's like a whole thing. So you got to have lead time. And this one, we didn't have much lead time. We just, we had to get it out kind of quick because it's of a timely manner. And we will listen to the talk that I recorded with Thea Wildcroft, which is totally awesome. We're going to listen to that next week. And the reason I did go ahead and decide to stick this one in, because I feel like it's important. I feel like we're at a really pivotal point in this discussion around yoga teacher training standards. And it's a conversation that's been going on for a long time. And I feel like I need to say just a couple of things to offer a little bit of background and context for the conversation that you're going to hear today. Because I forget that a lot of times people tune into this podcast who have never read any of the things that I've written or listened to any of my other podcasts before. Like this is the first time they know anything of me. And if you don't have any background for me, then I think sometimes you don't have a clear sense of what you're listening to. And those of you who have listened to me for a long time or read the blog posts that I've written over the last decade know that I've, I've changed my positions at times and I try to be very thoughtful and nuanced, especially when it's really hard topics that we're looking to consider. And Yoga Alliance is always one of those. Like whenever I write anything or whenever I've had a Yoga Alliance podcast, frankly, my readership and my listenership goes down. People like tune out. People just, it's such a frustrating, difficult, sort of just, I don't know, people aren't interested in engaging in it very often. But right now, I really feel like we have to. Like, if you care at all, if you call yourself a yoga teacher, I really think that, I don't know, shit's going down right now. And for those of you who don't know how we got to where we are, let me just give you like my own personal quick rundown of what brings me to where I was when I had this conversation with Andrew last week. I started teaching yoga before there was a 200-hour training. I remember when the Yoga Alliance released this 200-hour, 500-hour standard that they created, which I don't know if I don't really remember it being called a standard, but I remember they created these 200-hour, 300-hour programs. And the teacher that I was studying with at that time, Allison West, created a month-long 200-hour training program. Pretty much as soon as they released it, she was kind of on board. And 
I did that training, but it was pretty much an afterthought. I had been studying with her for two years. I'd been in her class regularly, and that month-long intensive that we did, I was already well familiar with that material. It was just sort of like this final huzzah of time that I had with her at the end. And I didn't register with the Yoga Alliance. At that time, it was really confused. People didn't even understand. And I think it's true some to this day that just completing the training doesn't mean that you're a registered yoga teacher. It means that you've been certified, but you have to go and register. And back then there was no website or anything. It was all like by mail and shit. So (laughs) I never registered with the Yoga Alliance at that time. And I set about being a teacher. I made my living as an independent teacher for a decade I eventually opened a center myself in 2007 in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I started a teacher training in 2008. I was not a registered yoga school for the first two years of doing that training. I was totally opposed to the organization because at that time, it really was completely a rubber stamp. A lot of people don't know this, but back then, I remember... You could register with the Yoga Alliance whether your training was through a registered school or not. There was two categories. You could register through a registered school or you could register through a non-registered school. And the only difference was like some additional paperwork and like 75 more dollars or something. And you literally just sent it in in the mail and then you got the certificate. It was just a rubber stamp. Literally, it was a rubber stamp And I was opposed to it. And I wrote this somewhat infamous blog post called Yoga Alliance Approved My Ass, where I was just calling bullshit on it and saying, this is nothing. And it was like when people first started talking about the 200-hour registered yoga teacher as like a credential. like, And I just thought, that's bullshit. Like, Yoga Alliance doesn't approve anybody And it was one of the first things that I ever wrote that kind of went viral. It had like a massive readership. And then not too long after, maybe like, I don't know how long after I wrote the blog post, within a year maybe, Yoga Alliance hired a new CEO named Richard Carpell. And Richard Carpell read that blog post and he called me up on the phone and we had a conversation and he he won me over basically. He said, I read your blog post. I think you're right about a lot of things. I want to try to change the organization and make it better. What do you think I should do? If you were in my position and you were in charge, what would you do? And I just thought it was so cool (laughs) to get reached out to like that and that kind of exchange. And I thought, I want to give this guy my support. So I wrote another blog post called giving Yoga Alliance a chance, and I registered myself. It was like 2012, I believe. And he was there for two years, and he did some things. I mean, it's debatable, (laughs) you know, how much, but he definitely did stuff. He took it from complete bullshit to the promise of something better. And I appreciated that. And then after two years, he left the job. The reasons why he left aren't entirely clear, but from what I understand, it it wasn't anything nefarious like some people talked about at that time. But he had to leave after two years. And I wrote a third blog post that said, what now, Yoga Alliance? Where I was wondering, what are they going to do now that he's gone? Are they going to continue on making it better? Or is it just going to like coast and not do anything again? And that's pretty much what happened. They coasted for two years. I know Andrew would take issue with me saying that. They were doing stuff behind the scenes that we couldn't see. But, you know, they just, we did, they didn't have a new CEO and and there wasn't much on the radar. And I I didn't talk about Yoga Alliance at all for like two years or whatever. And then a year and a half ago or whatever it was now, Andrew invited me to come to the Yoga Journal Conference. He came on the podcast. You can go back and listen to that if you want. And he talked about how there was this new person, David Lipsius, coming on. There was all these changes that were going to happen and the future of yoga. And then not too long after that, I had David Lipsius on the podcast. You can go back and listen to that. And 
I got a bunch of criticism <laughs> about that episode. You know, I'll admit the the new CEO of Yoga Alliance reaches out, says he wants to come on the podcast. I I, I felt it made me feel like I was important or something. I I went to the hotel room and met him in person, and he's a really charismatic guy. And honestly, I just wanted to meet the guy, and I just wanted to hear what he was going to plan to do. He just got in the job. He was like, just taking the job and was introducing himself to the community. And I thought, all right, well, that's a service. I wanted to meet him, and I'm sure other people would want to meet him too. But then I basically got accused of promoting the Yoga Alliance. Now, I think there's a lot of people out there who know the Yoga Alliance from the past as I know them from the past. And there were times in the past where you were trying to deal with Yoga Alliance and you had somebody on the phone and it was a bad experience. A lot of people got dissed by the Yoga Alliance, frankly. I remember if you were in New York, <laughs> there was a time where the Yoga Alliance came out on the other side of the question about whether or not the state should regulate us and everybody like got rid of their registrations. I mean, there's a lot of history between the yoga community and the Yoga Alliance. And some people who've been around for a long time remember a time where there's a lot of animosity and some of those old standing uh, feelings are, are not necessarily gone. And then I think that there's some other people who just think that yoga needs to be regulated. Like we just need to create higher standards. We need regulating bodies. There should be licensure. We should get the state involved. Some people are in favor of that. And I just got to say those people, in my opinion, don't really know what they're, they're asking for. Or maybe they do but their idea of yoga is very different from mine and they don't feel that having the state regulate them is going to impede upon the pedagogy and the process that they use to impart yoga. But myself and a lot of other people have a pretty good idea that that kind of regulation will absolutely squelch a lot of what people have benefited from. So... There's those two different kind of uh, camps out there. I know there's some people out there who I'm sure are tuning in who have already called for a boycott of Yoga Alliance. And, you know, I understand where some of those people are coming from because there are some, in my opinion, fundamental flaws. But call me a hopeless optimist, but I, I still think that there's the possibility for something good to come of it. However, I am very cynical. And taking the survey that they released recently made me feel even more cynical. And right when I was at the peak of really questioning, not just the survey, but like my registration, like I'm still registered with the Yoga Alliance. And I was thinking, fuck, do I even want to be registered anymore? Do I even believe in this organization? And what, what, what's... Is there any reason for me to be part of it anymore? That's when I got an email from Andrew Tanner saying, hey man, can I come on the podcast to talk about the standards review? We've released the survey and we want to get the word out. It was like almost right in the moment, it seemed. Right when I was in this deep turmoil over my Yoga Alliance status, the Yoga Alliance was reaching out to come talk. And so we scheduled it within like, a day or two of that email just last week. And so that's what you're going to get to hear today. This is an entirely candid conversation. We did not plan out any of it beforehand. Andrew and I do go way back as personal friends, even before he was part of the standards review. And so we have like a mutual respect for one another. And so I really spoke my mind to him as candidly and as honestly as I could, and I, I feel that he did the same back. So that's it. That's what you're going to hear today. Let me mention that this episode of Yoga Talks is sponsored by KarmaSoft. 
And if you're not familiar with what KarmaSoft is, let me tell you, it is a complete online yoga studio management solution. I use this software myself at my yoga center, which I mentioned earlier. I used it for eight years until I closed down this past fall. And I can say unequivocally that it is far superior to Mind Body Online. If you're a yoga teacher or a yoga center manager, or maybe you got a Pilates studio, or even just like a fitness center, and you need some software to run your business, the work of doing the scheduling and class payments and accounting can all be made far easier and more efficient by using KarmaSoft. And I have been saying this since long before they became a sponsor. You can go back and listen to episode 84 from October 2017, where I talked to Rooney Senecal. He's the founder of KarmaSoft. You can hear all about the company and my experience with it. I highly recommend KarmaSoft. Check it out at karmasoftonline.com. I also have some gigs coming up for anybody who wants to come hang out with me in person Starting this weekend in Easton, Pennsylvania, I've got a two-weekend long intensive March 2nd through 4th and 9th through 11th. I'm going to be in Japan March 16th through 25th. I'm going to be in East Hartford, Connecticut, April 8th. I'm going to be in Fishkill, New York, April 14th. And I'm going to be in Falls Church, Virginia, April 27th through 29th. You can find out about those gigs and more. You can read the blog and listen to the archives of this podcast and find all of my online yoga video offerings at jbrownyoga.com. Please, as always, if you're listening and you're enjoying and getting something from the podcast, maybe you would do us a solid and show a bit of support by going to a blog or podcast page and making a direct donation or going to Apple Podcasts and iTunes and writing a review and giving us some stars. That stuff's helpful. We appreciate it. Okay, I know this has been a bit of a long intro. My apologies. Sometimes that happens. I will touch base with you on the other side, but let's get to it, my friends. Here we go. This is my talk with Andrew Tanner from the Yoga Alliance. All right, well, look, let's, let's turn off this video. And, um, yeah. you know, you and I haven't talked in a while, and I'm sure we could uh, catch up for a long time and shoot the shit. But, uh, you know, I feel like uh, you're here on some official capacity and we should get to it so I'm with you. Let's do it. All right. Because, you know, um, the survey came out this week. Mm-hmm. And um, I took the survey. I got to be honest with you, man. I felt, I felt dirty a little bit after I, I took the survey. I didn't feel so good about the survey, so I need to talk oh, to you no. about it. That's yeah, terrible. man. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm curious as to why. I, I'm, I'm wondering if you're, you know, putting ideas into our heads that aren't there, but I, Oh, see, but, I don't think so. But, but I you, think that the survey was really designed to get, I mean, and I was deeply involved in creating it. Um, we've already gotten over 6,000 responses, which is amazing. The survey company told me, um, people really care. They're writing really interesting responses and we don't even, I don't even know what we're going to get, but, um, I guess this was kind of the first step of the standards process was to really see, like we hear stuff on Facebook of people either hating Yoga Alliance or loving Yoga Alliance or being very kind of neutral about it. But I feel like Facebook is such an echo chamber that we didn't really, we don't really know what our community really feels until we actually survey them. So that was kind of the first part of this, of this standards review process. I get that, but I have to say that I feel that it seems to me that there is like a there's a flaw in the survey process, and I'm not sure that in my mind it is going to accurately do what you just said. Well, let, please, by all means, tell me about it because yes, let's let's not let me ask you let me ask you let me ask you a couple of questions. I I mean I'm prepared to get a little bit into the weeds about specific questions with you, but I before we would do any of that, I, let me ask you just a few questions about the survey so I can 
maybe dispense with some of the questions. Should we context it for people, like what's going on, or do you think everyone knows what's oh, going on? They might. Or, I mean, I can try to run it down, and then you can add to it if you feel like there's more to it. So, you know, you, you know, I, I spoke to you at a yoga journal conference. God, I don't know, maybe it was like six months ago or something. I can't remember when it was. We talked about there was new things happening at the Yoga Alliance. Uh, David Lipsius was coming on. David Lipsius came on and we talked all about the new efforts that he wanted to put forth. Uh, some of those efforts have gone into place. There's a, 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 an ethical code that's being worked on. There's a scope of practice document that's happening. And you are heading up a standards review. Yeah, and the and, details of that haven't even really gone out yet, so I'd love to talk about that at some point. Okay, but, well, there was, like, the launch of the Standards Review Project website, which I don't know if we should, maybe that's going to take us into the weeds already. I already had a little bit of an issue about that, but let's let's not start there. I want to start with the, the survey that went out uh, that was part of, as far as I can tell, like you said, the effort that you're leading for the Standards Review. Is that right? Yep. Uh, this, this, I mean, basically, the standard review, really quick, has has four or five parts to it. Starts with a survey to both members and non-members, and we're not uh, we're seeking feedback from both yoga practitioners, yoga teachers, uh, registered yoga teachers, um, people that are involved in yoga studios. It's a pretty, and we're trying to get as diverse uh, back, uh, you know, answers as we can. International. We're having the survey out in six languages. So that's step one. Step two is we're going to have these eight advisory working groups that are going to work on eight specific, uh, what I call that, I call them areas of intrigue <laughs> within the standards that where, where we feel that we could make changes to the standards without just uprooting the whole system. Um, you know, we're not necessarily rewriting the standards from scratch, but um, the idea of moving from hours based to say competencies based this is a big deal and something that um needs to be hashed out and the eight different groups are now up on the standards on the yastandards.com site the scope of practice and code of conduct groups are the first two groups those actually have people in the working groups and the work is actually starting next week um and but we're still really looking for people for all these other groups groups that are going to talk about qualifications for being a yoga teacher, qualifications for being a teacher trainer. That's a huge, important one. Um, core curriculum questions, whether we should have an, uh, an exam or not, and how, how, what, is, what would competency standards look like? Um, like that, that's not a foregone conclusion. I think that there's a mixture of you know, feedback from a survey, um, feedback from a working group of advisors, and then all the work that the working groups do will be publicly and transparently put on the YA Standards website, and then public the public will be able to comment on it, um, and it'll be not it'll happen in a forum that um, is transparent but is also civil, so it's not going to be like Facebook where everyone is just. Um, ad hominem attacking each other, but we really want ideas and creative ideas to come to the fore. Um, and then all of that will happen over the whole course of 2018, and it'll all be in the public view. And then Yoga Alliance staff and leadership is going to look at all that information and all that input and make some suggested changes to the standards, which we're then going to actually put to votes. Mm, um, that was one of my it, questions. Yeah, yeah. So that's all. It's kind of that information. Why I wanted to tell, get that out there is because it's a little bit buried on the Y standard site right now. We, we're we're making some updates to it. Who knows? By the time this blog goes out, it may already be updated. But um, that information, I, I think, when people hear that, they're like, "Oh, wow, that's a pretty." Inclusive well, process. All right, but, but I, understand. Said, I appreciate. I appreciate it, brother. I want this. What I'm here for. All right, because look, I appreciate that there's going to be some kind of democratic process, and that we're going to get to see documents and vote on them before they get implemented. That's all. That's all good news. But I here's where here's where I felt weird in this survey, and let's let's kind of go back to that survey because that's my personal experience and why I came into the conversation with that sentiment. Yep. So who 
who wrote the questions for the survey? Uh, you're talking to one of the chief architects of it, but we worked with a whole, there were a whole slew of people that were involved at various points. Um, but I guess I oversaw the final process along with a lot of other staff members, board members, um, advisors, and then we worked with um, a team called Edge Research um, that does surveys. Third, you know, they they're the ones that kind of help make sure that the questions will give you valuable data. And I think that's what you're going to call into question. And, and like we've already, we're getting feedback. We're getting amazing feedback from people. And we're already realizing there are some questions where we didn't define a term well enough. Or, and that's just going to happen. But I do think we're going to get some very interesting data out of this um, that's going to help us understand where our community is at. But, but here's, anyway, here's I'm, I'm, I want to stop you there because that, yeah, that, the next part of it is like, Okay, so you were someone who was very involved in writing with the questions. How did you decide what the questions were going to be? Like, what was your, what was, because I believe that there, your bias is in the questions. Hell yeah, of course my bias is in the questions. I mean, I'm as, I, you know, the, whoever was involved in writing them is going to be biased. Um, but at the same time, I guess my role, my job at Yoga Alliance right now, I'm no longer the spokesman. My role is, we're calling it yoga advancement. It's about how do we, you know, work, how do we have yoga um, as a field in the world um, at continue to advance while not losing its soul, if you will. Um, and I guess how we thought, how I thought about the questions um was what are the things, all the feedback, I've been traveling around for Yoga Alliance as their spokesperson for the last four years. I don't think anyone on the planet has heard more complaints about Yoga Alliance than me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anyone, so, so I felt like my job over the last four years put me in a unique place to ask questions that represent the views of as many constituents as possible. Um, and I know it's not going to be everyone, but that's why the survey is just one piece of what we're doing. I will say I didn't personally write all the questions. We have a diversity and inclusion consultant at, at Yoga Alliance right now that we work with. Um, we have th – the survey was looked at by at least 10 different people within staff, um, and there's a lot of different opinions even among people on our staff. So – it's definitely not bias free. I don't think anything can be, but I guess I'm I'm more curious about what like like certainly some questions are there for a reason, um, and so if you want to dive into that, I'm more than happy to. Sure. Um, I mean, I just I felt like um, like any time you do a survey like that. Uh, there's a certain bias, as you're admitting, which I appreciate, that goes into the writing of those questions and those surveys, and that that bias kind of inherently steers the data. And then once you get data, like how you interpret that data could be in a lot of different ways. Like there's a, a book, I, I believe, I don't know if you know, it's called How to Lie with Statistics. And yeah, it, I don't very, know the book, but I, I can yeah, add, I can get it's the very, It's very like with political polls and stuff. And I'm not like yeah. suggesting some kind of nefarious motive on your part or anything. I'm sh I just feel like when I was taking it, like there was all these instances where there was obviously the right answer to make. Uh, you know, so. See, I, I disagree because we're getting a lot of different answers. Like, but. But I mean, so if it's obvious to you, that means that's what you feel the answer probably should be. I guess. Well, no, no, let no, me, no, no, no. Let's 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 use an example. Weeds, man, we got to get into the weeds for for this. Yeah. Go all right, it. but like, let's we can use some examples. All right, so it'll say like, uh, okay, assuming there are ways to measure competency throughout a teacher training course, which is already a. a pretty big assumption that we don't even know yes. what it means. We don't of even course. know what it means to measure competency, right? We haven't established right. what that would mean. Yep. We then separate that from what is an appropriate number of training hours that should be required in a teacher training course qualifying one to teach yoga. So you've, you've basically framed it as 
teacher and training that- hours is how we're going to determine it. And nah. then there's a slider. Okay. There's a slider, a nice big yeah. slider. Zero to 1,000 hours, right? And then there's like another little thing right underneath there that said, Numbers of hours should not be determined, uh, should not determine if a teacher is qualified. But Correct. To click that one position, which you know is my position, right? To click too, that man. one position. I click that too. And I'm not even, I'm but, probably not supposed okay, to Okay, well, that's, that, but. that's cool to hear. But to click that in a way sort of said, oh, that means that you're in favor of really crappy yoga teachers who only get their certificate in a weekend. No, no. Like, I like because okay. I think because you're reading we're, way too much because we're no, no. You're tricking gray area questions, and you're you're asking for black and white answers. So, like, what we talk about the data, right? So, like, if you know, okay. So, if let's say forty percent of the respondents think that it's a good idea for Yoga Alliance to use additional resources to ensure that schools are complying, which would you, you cited site visits and uh, additional, additional staff in compliance and annual affirmations that uh, previous information provided by a school is accurate. So basically, should we be the yoga police, right? Basically. Well, I, so okay, well, let, let me finish. Let me finish my thoughts. So forty yeah, percent of people say yes, I think that's a good idea, right? And then no uh, thirty five percent say no I don't. And then like fifteen percent say not sure. What does that really tell us about whether or not people think the, the yoga alliance could be the yoga place? It doesn't tell us anything. Okay, because well, I can say so. Let's let's back this up. Let me answer your questions because you've got two really interesting questions. Let me so we don't lose the first one. Let me go back to that. Okay. The slider scale the, question. The slider okay. scale and whether okay. or not it should be hours at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So first of all, if you don't assume competencies, right? Then then you almost everyone who thinks about the question logically would say, well, hours don't matter. It matters how good the training is and how how competent the trainers and the training is. That's why we had to have that in the question. Assuming that it's a competent training and that training trainees are going to be held to some levels of competency, how many hours do you think is appropriate for a teacher? Like, what's your best guess at how many hours it takes to train someone to be competent. That's what that question is trying to get to. What it's not, what we're not trying to get to with that is, look, everyone said it should be X number of hours. Therefore, we're going to change the the survey, to, the, the standard to X number of hours. This is one piece, this survey, and you're, you're right. It's not perfect. And we're going to learn a lot from how we do this survey. And I think it's really good that we're having this discussion. And in fact, when the results actually come out, because by the way, until we get the results tabulated, which will be like sometime in late March, we don't really know what we're even talking about. But I think when that comes out, then we have to have a really robust and transparent discussion about this stuff. And I'm excited for that. I, I do think that we don't know. I, I know that we wrote this, this survey without trying to guide people towards any particular answer. Really, 100% that was our purpose. In fact, um, the, the survey company helps with that. Like They make sure that the questions get, the order of the questions gets shifted, the order of the possible responses gets shifted and randomized. Um, we're trying to, we're not trying to influence um, someone's answers for sure. And if we do that because of our own bias and we find that out because an expert points that out or believe me, we've received feedback um, from people taking the survey already about particular questions that they felt like, like the one you just pointed out. Right. That if you're not trying to, if you're not trying to put forth a particular agenda about ours, then the question would just be, do you think that the number of hours should determine whether a teacher is qualified? Yes or no? That's what, I guess well, so to like actually, have like, it be like, oh, how many hours would it be? Or you think it's not about hours? It frames it in a way that it it makes it seem like, oh, the smart person chooses it. And ha- of course, and I get it. Like you and I have had this conversation before. Like people want an objective metric. They want yeah, an objective I mean, metric. Even with a competency based standard, we're actually saying in the question, competencies isn't even a question. 
It's like if you go to any so university. So if it's about competencies, then why are we asking about hours? Because why are we asking so, someone to put an hour number on it if we want it to be about competency? Because, Jay, you have to have a, an intuition. Like, like, okay, we have to have an intuition about oh, everyone always says 200 hours isn't enough. We hear that all the time. But, like, what is enough? But, like, like, but that's and, the and, issue. Like, that's a misperception. It's like a, it's a thing. I understand. I again, I've had that same conversation. I hear that all again and again. It's not enough. But what, I've talked to a lot of people, as have you, not just on right. the podcast, but even before I had the podcast. I've been having these conversations for as long as I can remember. And anybody I've ever talked to, uh, who's ever done any sort of teacher training or bringing people into teaching. Everybody admits the same thing. Everybody admits that it can't be about hours. Even you check the box that says number of hours should not determine if a teacher is qualified. So to right. start from the place where we say it needs to be more hours is already taking us down a path that I feel like. Well, Jay, is- I think, okay, if, if a certain number of months from now we end up recommending that it be a based on the hours, I think then your argument's valid. But I, I really think that we don't know what, I guess I, you're reading a lot into the question that I wasn't thinking about. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and frankly, <laughs> I'm, what I'm trying to point out is the survey is one mechanism within the standards review process. Nothing we do is going to be perfect. But if we have many mechanisms, we have the standard, uh, sorry, we have the survey, we have working groups, we have feedback from the um, community, we have the staff, uh, and their opinion really matters because the organization actually has to be, like, things have to be possible. So even, for example, the second question you mentioned that you were concerned about, like, Mm -hmm. are we going to do site visits, you know, to schools? Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, I love. We'd love to know what people think about that question, but like, there's also a question of whether how that would ever be done fairly, whether or not we can afford it. But let's say that just based on because you put this as a hypothetical, that all these people want to in- increase accountability. Okay, mm-hmm. which by the way is is a popular theme among people. Not your, not necessarily your opinion, but. Oh, nor my opinion. But no, I'm in favor of accountability, but how people are held accountable and by who is the question. Correct, correct. So let's say that, that the question that we framed, I think, is very fair, which says, are you in favor of more accountability? Like, these are examples of ways in which things can be accountable. Now, if we get a lot of positive response from that, the next step Yoga Alliance has to take is, okay, wow, you know, 70, 65% or 70% of you say, you want more accountability. All right, we're going to put together a, you know, a, a, probably a committee or a team to figure out what can we actually do. And then we'll propose something and say, here's what we're proposing. What do you think, membership? You know, what do you think, community? Yeah, but this, this is a, this is a, a echo, echo chamber you're just describing, right? So you, you set it up by saying that, you know, uh, in, in holding people accountable means that Yoga Alliance is going to do site visits or some kind of enforcement regime where they're going to be the police in a way that they haven't before. You know, you you, you set it up to mean that accountability means that. There's no argument in there for uh, another way of holding ourselves accountable Not, as individuals, yeah, right. as a collective, like... Not in this survey, but there is, as I mentioned, this survey is not the end-all, be-all. This is one data point. We are going to have an entire committee focused on accountability. We're actually calling it integrity because accountability has a lot. I like integrity. Encouraging people to have integrity makes sense. Holding people accountable sounds like police. Right, and and we're not. I don't think we could ever be the yoga police. I do think that's why we named the committee integrity, not accountability. And the the that what I keep trying to say is, I think if you if you look at everything as the end all be all, like the survey is gonna whatever the responses of the survey are, it's gonna decide our fate or decide the alliance's fate, then I, I imagine that would be scary. And what I want to say is don't, don't 
jump too far down that rabbit hole. I really appreciate all of this conversation because, and I think people need to hear this and Yoga Alliance as leaders, we need to hear this. Um, and, and you're not the only one giving it to us. In the survey, there's, there's a number of open-ended questions and we're getting amazing responses in those open-ended questions. We've already had over 6,000 people fill out the survey. So we have a lot of data to crunch in that sense and not just like specific question data, but also attitudes and idea data, uh, which we can use algorithms to, to suss out. So, <laughs> well, I mean, let me say something. A, let me, but wait, 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 one sec, one sec, Jay. I want to say something because you talk about yoga police, and I just want to make a point that I think gets lost on people, which is Yoga Alliance is a voluntary nonprofit membership association. And we, and a registry, we know. We have a registry. No. Potentially, we could decide to move to a credential, which would mean act some form of testing or something. That's definitely on the that's on the board as a that's on the docket as a question in this survey in the standards review process. So one of the committees is uh, the integrity committee is going to also think about um, should there be some kind of national or even international test that covers some very basics. Like should every yoga teacher know certain things about anatomy and physiology? Should every, and let me phrase that, every Yoga Alliance certified yoga teacher, should they know about the history of yoga? Should they know um, about some yoga philosophy, etc.? So we are not, what we're not is saying is that every yoga teacher needs to do this. But what we're saying is, Everyone that wants to continue using the Yoga Alliance standard, if, if the Yoga Alliance standard has currently become so influential, we want to, as, as the, as the um, keepers of that standard, we want to make that standard mean something. Um, and the difference between Yoga Alliance holding a standard and, let's say, a government organization holding the standard is the use of force. Yoga Alliance doesn't force anyone to take our standard, uphold our standard. Um, but if we are going to keep giving out the standard, we should at least um, hold people to integrity of the standard that we set. And that that's, I think, what what, what should allay the fears of folks. No, you're fear. making me more nervous right now. Uh, because, okay. because, 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 look, you're talking about Yoga Alliance transitioning from what it's currently been, which a lot of people have been unhappy with, and I've certainly spoken out against in the past, to a credentialing and or and or a regulating body, which no, I guess no, no. Whoa, would be the same thing. You just said that. No, you said it's on the table that you might have to take a test and we might be the person who hands out the credential. Let me, and, let me, let me please allow me to clarify. This is a very important point. Yoga Alliance, right, is... If Yoga Alliance, Yoga Alliance is not, um, you don't, no one needs to have a Yoga Alliance uh, credential, a re- registration right now to teach yoga, right? Oh, but no. they will if you would become the credentialing body. No, they won't. No, they won't. They're, they're credentialing, credential is just a word. You're as, you uh, a, no. Right? no, no, it is just a word, but those words matter, man. Look, no, licensing here, you've come on this podcast many times, and the main thing that Yoga Alliance done that has actually served the profession, the reason why you got Leslie to talk for you guys and be, be a supporter rather than a hater, is that you guys took a better position on not letting the states regulate yoga teacher training programs. You didn't do it in New York, but after that, you guys got on the right side of history. And we did a lot 11 of people, states. Yeah. A lot, I know. You guys have done all kinds of advocacy work. But now, essentially, you're talking about Yoga Alliance doing what we have been advocating to stop the state from doing. There's because if you do that, if you state, do that, if like, you say, if you say, oh, now we're we we've, we've developed, we've done all this work, and we've developed these new credentials for yoga teachers and this new scope of practice and this new ethical guidelines, and it's totally volunteer. You don't have to sign up, but you know what? If you don't sign up, you are going to end up being restricted, most definitely. Who, That's not well, a paranoid thought. Man. So do you think once that, you set, you you've set it with the licensure? No, no, no. Hold on. You're, you're way, you're all over the place, Jay. Listen to me, man. <laughs> I, you're right about what, 
everything up until the licensure thing. That's the big difference. If we, okay, if Yoga Lines didn't exist over the last five years, Mm -hmm. you would have vocational school licensure and potentially licensure of yoga teachers in at least That's not true. 11 we states. did it without Yoga Alliance in New York. It could have been done I, that way in other states. You can't say that. You there, can't take all I that credit. There in, I was there in New York. I was a member of Yoga for New York. I own the website Yoga for New York. It was really <laughs> hard. We almost didn't make it. Other states, the likelihood of them being able to do it or actually setting up licensors is way higher. So, Okay, so I will, I will grant you that Yoga Alliance okay. did... That good advocacy work, but now but, you're setting so yourselves up not, to be no. the licensees, the licensors. It's, it's the opposite because here's the thing: people want to have their cake and eat it too, Jay. We've got people on in your camp and Leslie's camp and Alex Auger and those folks that don't want any form of regulation, right, or any form of uh, anything to get in the. It's not that we way. don't. No, we don't think that. We don't yeah. see how the organization of Yoga Alliance or any state government is in a position to regulate it. Correct. And once you try to now, assume that position, you've already stepped us into like waters that are, are, are against what many of us have come to understand is best for Jay, you. Jay, my friend, the, the use of force is different than a voluntary organization. Leslie Kamenoff and, uh, and Alex Auger will never need to register with the Yoga Alliance unless the, a state government or a federal government comes in and f- forces them via, via the instrument of force to to let, become licensed in some way. If you have a strong, self-governing organization like Yoga Alliance, then you can avoid that situation and you can have the best of both worlds. If you don't have a strong, self-governing organization, then People are, right now, the the word on the street, if you haven't heard, is that the Yoga Alliance standard is not that strong. It it hasn't been updated in 17 years. Wouldn't you agree? Or, 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 I mean, that's at least what a lot of people come on on the podcast and and rail about. I mean, I think think the issue is that that the standard, like there's three parts to the government. Which What's is that? not fair. You're no, 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 no. I'm not saying that you're becoming... I'm saying that you have done advocacy work so that some outside person couldn't come in and tell me what my teacher training is supposed to be. And, mm-hmm. and Yoga Alliance is protecting my interest in that regard. But now what you're saying is there's a lot of people out there who think... And in my opinion, it's a, it's a misdirected conception that the answer to making uh, better yoga teachers or more highly qualified yoga teachers is more hours. But I think that it's always been, and this is um, like a, a, a diplomatic way to say it, it has been an intellectually dishonest standpoint that many of us have been complicit in for many years because we all know that that you can't measure training in hours Mm -hmm. and yet we're trying to act like you can and that question that's what set me off with the slider because we're trying to say so how many hours should it be when most smart people know that it shouldn't be about hours now i'm not saying there wouldn't be guidelines you see there was another question where you said something like which of the following standards or guidelines and i think that there's a difference there there's a difference between there's a difference between the yoga alliance offering resources that individuals can use to make a good training programs and to me, there's a big difference between like the three parts, like the, the ethical code and the scoop of practice. Like those, I believe there's, there's consensus to be had there across many diverse traditions. You know, like yeah. most people think it's mm-hmm. wrong for a yoga teacher to hurt people. So, I, and I think that the Yoga Alliance taking these steps to have um, actions that people can take and ways to report uh, misbehaviors, I think that's all good stuff. I think that's a good role for the Yoga Alliance to play. It, it makes it uh, relevant, frankly. But the standards element is like the third rail of it. <laughs> and to me, like they get they get confused. And as you know, I think that Yoga Alliance would better serve its mission 
if it would stop trying to enforce ours and let those be guidelines and find other ways to encourage integrity other than becoming the yoga police. Right. And, and so let's talk about some of the other questions that were on there because there was a question on mentorship. That's so, so believe me, I'm, n- no one in our side is in the hours camp. But we, no, we're as wary of hours. I'm as wary of hours as anyone. And I think it sounds like that that question was definitely triggering because it brings <laughs> up. Well, there was a couple others, but that was but, in particular but, because, again, it goes to the heart. Like, the question was framed in a way that makes someone maybe, quite frankly, who hasn't been having these conversations for years and years and years but is a member, automatically feel like to be a responsible yoga teacher, to want to further yoga, to want to be feel good and proud about their profession – they, they have to set a thousand hours or something like it. I feel like it actually well, let's plays. See what the data, let's see what the data actually says. And you may be right. I don't know. But I also hold out that I don't think that I, we don't have to. Ju- I mean, look, we're having this, this big conversation out in the public mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I appreciate that. We don't have to. You know, my intention, we're not trying to hide anything. We, we are trying to become more and more transparent so that, like, like people forget that, like, the people that work at Yoga Lines, it's like the government. In, in, not to make that analogy there, but <laughs> the government changes when, you, when new people come in. So we get people saying, like, you know, Yoga Alliance did this, Yoga Alliance did that. Like, as if Yoga Alliance is a monolith that, you know, has its own agenda, whereas it really depends on the people that get involved. And if anything, I think what the leadership right now is showing is that we are out there listening, talking, having conversations, giving people access to help us steward the organization and help us steward what is yoga alliance's mission and what i mean like like the standards is one that's a good question let's talk about the mission because i've been really questioning the mission of the organization in all of this like believe me i'm coming at you hard because i did have like a reaction to the survey it like triggered me and then i i've been evaluating that in myself and like okay what am i so how do i feel about the fact that i'm registered quite honestly uh, and, yeah. and, and do I support what this organization is doing or not? And, you know, and I look at the mission, you know, it's to promote and support the integrity and diversity yeah, of diversity of yoga, which I can changing. totally agree with. But then it, 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 there's a list of things. And some of this stuff is a little bit where I have questions. It says advocating for self-regulation in the yoga industry. And, and I do advocate for that. But for me, self-regulation means I regulate myself. It doesn't mean that the organization regulates me. And then the other part that's, and this is maybe the most important part, and this is like where my real question comes from because it goes to other questions I'm having in in a broad sense for like our society, quite honestly, Mm -hmm. because that's what David talked about when I talked about him, about how we could be a force of good as a profession to address some of these like problems of like growth models, you know? And I just feel like I don't feel like the organization is run in any kind of horizontal or collective way. I feel like there's a lot of money at play at the organization and the way that money gets used, you know, in in terms of even just like the advertising that the organization buys, like how does buying ads in yoga journal magazine help promote and support the integrity and diversity of yoga? It seems to me that's mostly about growing the membership. And that right, a not the profit that organization that's, yeah. that's funded by business means. There's the other issue of the, the, the partners and the perks, which I feel is almost a little disingenuous, where you've got, you know, you've got a list of 80,000 yoga teachers that's worth a lot of money to a company to put a promo code ad in the newsletter, and they pay to do that, and then they're called a partner, and it's a member perk. It just it feels to me like I don't... I'm trying to get on board with the the spirit that you're bringing to this conversation of we're going to be open and do good, but I just question like the structure. You know, I know uh, David was like a not for profit is not a corporation, but a lot of times they they function in a similar manner. Well, let me let me address some of the things you said because all of those are super important points, and there's been a lot of change afoot. I mean, David took over. 
towards the end of last year, um, the first thing that we did was we and we actually restructured. And if you don't know, Yoga Alliance is two separate organizations, a C6 nonprofit and a C3 nonprofit. The C6 is a membership association, just like a, you'd have a membership to, if you were an architect, to the Architects of America Association. And the job of the association is to set standards, um, set you know, provide membership benefits, provide continuing education. Um, and we're doing all that. And we're starting with the, sur- with the survey. We're starting with a refreshing look at the standards. And please, we don't know what is going to come out of these standards. Maybe at the end of it, all we come out and say, no changes, but we, just, we are going to um, – hold people accountable to the standards as they currently exist, you know, or who knows? We, we, we don't know. what the... If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.